So it's kind of all over now with the elections. My Brigitte yesterday, she said it's not all over yet, but I've heard that the Reformation Party, that they have decided to jump the fence and will probably merge with the independents. So this hope for the opposition parties now to form a coalition is, is gone. Is that right? Well, I, I think it's too early to know exactly what their positions are going to be because they've bounced both ways. But that's my expectation now, that there will be a coalition with the Independence Party. Yeah. So all of the things that you were saying in your lecture, I totally agree. The problem with representative politics are people that are not being represented at all. And the whole winner-takes-all system in the United States, it's as if a lot of people haven't even voted At the same time, I was asking a question about certain models of direct democracy, for example, liquid democracy, and you said to me at the time that this was open to similar types of corruption as representative politics. But at the time, I was thinking, but surely with proximity, if I choose somebody, then there's a relationship of trust and also perhaps a duty of care because of the personal contact. But then I was speaking with Smari and another one of the Pirate Party people from Germany and they articulated a couple of problems. One was with security, anonymity, which is what everybody wants, but you've got to make sure people don't vote twice or, you know, it's got to be authenticated. And the other one was something that was called transitive delegation. The problem was that if I trust you with my vote, then you may pass it on in turn to somebody I don't trust. So if I've got no problem with cognitive dissonance, that may be okay, but it is actually a problem straight away. So could you think of any models? I mean, the German guy said only half of my vote would pass on, but I think this is just terribly messy. Can you think of any practical ways, even though it's maybe not the dream for tomorrow, whereby we could get models of representation that are using digital platforms, given that it is a little bit hard for everybody to get into a room together? Well, I guess I've become committed to the position that the answer to that question is no. That the problem with that question is that it it assumes that by we, we must mean all of us at the same time at any moment. And I think that's a mistake. I think we have to develop a richer sense of what it means to say we the people that doesn't demand that it's a measure of what all of us happen to believe at any one moment and instead develop a sense of we which is um, almost jury-like. So when you want to know what we the people think about Brexit, get a random sample, representative thousand people, put them in a room. Um, give them the information on both sides. Let them deliberate about it. Let them think about what the implications are. And then ask them the question, what we, should we do about Brexit? Um, and that, begin, that is a richer, more meaningful sense of who, what, what we think than a poll or a referendum happen, that's happened to be taken at any one moment. And, and I think that <coughs> you've got to push towards this sense of um, understanding what democracy means because it's too much to expect that we all are going to understand these issues at any one moment and we should just give it up and and you know accept the humility of what it means to be living lives with a million demands on us at any one time yeah i asked slavoj zizek if people should have to do a test before they vote to understand whether they're aware of what the issues are and he was quite shocked by that but i think i saw but the same problem as you do, but from another... Yeah, I mean, I want to be clear. I, I don't believe in tests to vote. What I'm talking about is being, um, is being narrow about the context in which we're asking all of us to participate. So I think all of us should elect representatives, absolutely. And I don't think there should be any qualification in te- uh, you know, test or intelligence or anything on that, because they represent us. So for representative democracy, all of us are participating. But when you want more out of the people than just periodic um, uh, affirmation of who the representatives are, then you've got to think more um, effectively about who the people are. 
Um, and so when I hear liquid democracy as a concept to be applied to the full range of issues, so as a kind of better direct democracy than, um, than what direct democracy is, I resist it because it still seems to me to engage in this completely unrealistic, Herculean assumption about humans, you know, that in some sense we are, you know, informed enough to know what the answer to all these questions should be. And we're not. And so given we're not, we should stop building models that assume what we are and instead build models that are um, more realistic, more uh, humble about our capacity. Not because we're stupid, but because we're engaged in a million other things at any one time. And, and, and it's not, and, you know, I'm perfectly happy to say citizens should be called together once a year, a random selection group to sit down and focus on 10 issues that we need views about. And they should be, you know, forced to spend two weeks doing that or a week doing that, just like you're called to a jury. Okay, that's fine. Um, but beyond particular contexts like that, I want to have a very minimal demand on we the people and their capacity to be engaged in policy making. Yeah. Well, I'm just assuming that they didn't know enough. Perhaps you would question why. But what I've found, because I do interact with people a lot on social media, and when I was working a lot with WikiLeaks, I came to the conclusion that people will voice an opinion no matter how little yeah. they know about a particular topic. They will think that's all there is to know. One well, let's be very clear about the people there. Yeah. That's a very select set of the people, right? Yeah. Most people are not like that. Most people don't want to engage in that kind of discussion. <laughs> Most people, you know, I don't know what the proportion is, but, you know, a bunch of people would say, heck, I don't know anything about that issue. There's a wonderful survey done about, I mean, tests done where they create these hypothetical candidates, but they present them as if they are real candidates to these group of people. And, of course, you get a significant number of these people who want to engage ferociously defending or attacking these completely fictional candidates, right? <laughs> because, you know, they must be true. You know, so, so the point is, people have all sorts of weirdnesses about this kind of, and what we need to do is to neutralize all the weirdness by getting a really representative group of us, giving us the information we need, and then allowing us to deliberate about them. And then you can tell me what we the people think. Just like, as a lawyer, if, you know, you, bought, you got 12 people in a room, it's called a jury. Uh, what a jury is allowed to say is the product of a very long process where they're very restricted in the information they're allowed to have and they have to deliberate and then they have to come to a unanimous vote in a criminal jury and then they tell us what their view is. And if in any moment of the, you know, that long process you took a poll of the jury and you said, no, 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 this is what the jury thinks, you know, the lawyer is trained to think, no, no, that's, the jury has no right to speak like that. The only way the jury has a right to speak is after they've gone through this whole process and, and said something. We need that sense of, we the, of what we the people think um, to be a much more present part of the dynamic of, of democracy than it is right now. And, and, and that's why I resist things that try to short circuit that recognition. I really liked... Uh what you said about it has to be unanimous because if it has to be unanimous I've got to listen to you mm -hmm. and uh, otherwise if it can just be a majority then I don't have to listen anymore. One of the criticisms of the crowdsourcing event for the Icelandic constitution was that it was way too short and also that the people who were on the smaller assembly didn't have the necessary tools or experience or time to, to actually communicate and, and process the information mm -hmm. that was coming in. I think you said in the lecture that one day was, was not enough, but how would you actually envisage this as a process? How long would it actually be? You said about a week? Before? Well, it depends on the, pop, on, on the problem. Um, yeah. You know, the, what, um, what I liked about the National Forum was it, was it was asking a question that people should be relatively close to. Um, which is like, what are the values that you know you identify with Iceland that should be informing this constitution? It's hard to get a process going in the course of a day, so I think it needs to be longer than a day. But it's not a crowdsource project to say what should the constitution say. Now that would be a really hard crowdsource project because most people have no clue of what a constitution is about, and they're not going to have any idea about you know whether there should be separation of powers or there should be a unicameral or bicameral legislature. All those are like way beyond 
the ordinary experience of most people. Yeah. But like, what are the values of Iceland? Well, I, you know, if you're a citizen of Iceland, you you know, you lived here for a while. You should have, begin to have a way to understand that. And if they're skilled um, leaders of the conversation, they should be able to elicit that in a relatively short time. I'm not expert enough to say it should be a day or two days or four days or a weekend, whatever. But I, but I do agree with people that it seems like a single day is not enough. Um, but again, it depends on the question. You know, I want to I try to map the same process that happened here in the United States to ask the question about certain amendments to the Constitution, you know, which again doesn't seem to me to require um, an, an education in constitutional history. Um, um, but does require something more than just, you know, gathering people for an afternoon and say, what do you think of this? Mm. Um, but it's got to be fit to what we know people know or understand and what they can be expected to learn in a relatively short time. Yeah. I don't know if you saw that series, a uh, documentary series called The Virtual Revolution. No, I haven't seen uh, Dr. Alex Krotovsky, I think her name is. But uh, she was talking about the history of Wikipedia. And I do remember I was lecturing in France at the time and my cohort had the utmost contempt for Wikipedia in the late 90s. Any student was finished if they started quoting Wikipedia. But 15 years down the track, Wikipedia was reputed to be 1% more reliable than Encyclopedia Britannica. And she claimed that what this showed was that the greater number of people who contribute to a body of knowledge, the more reliable that knowledge becomes. What do you think about this wiki idea? Well, I, I'm a big fan of Wikipedia, um, but you know, I think that even Jimmy Wales um, understands the context in which one should be uh, at least skeptical about um, the, quote, knowledge that Wikipedia is presenting. Theoretically, we do know that if you have a large, diverse body um, focused on a problem, committed to you know, having some commitment to getting the right answer, you're going to do much better in getting that answer than you will if you have a narrow, even elite group mm. looking at that problem. Um, that's the work of Scott Page and others that are mm. looking at the value of diversity in, in intellectual environments. But Wikipedia is not necessarily a context within which every article has you know, a large, diverse group looking at it. Right? There are many corners of Wikipedia where just five people have looked at something or 10 people have looked yeah, at something. Right. And the opportunity for um, uh, sabotage is quite great. Um, uh, so you know, I think that's to say that it's not that you should be certain that any particular fact you find in Wikipedia will be true. It's just that the process for correcting and checking um, is more robust and ongoing, continuous. Um, yeah, I think that's something I left out of her, her assertion was that the system itself yes. is allowed to self-correct. Yeah, that's exactly what it does. And I think Aaron Schwartz was on about that. Was yeah, it's a read system. It in a way that the good yeah. stuff would percolate to right. the top. Right. So what do you think is going to happen here in Iceland in particular? Are we Is everything going to stagnate for another three years? or do you Well, think I think that... Um, you know, the Superdrama Syndrome, which is, there's this, all this energy that leads to some event, I mean, some election-like event, and then nothing changes, that uh, you've seen replicated in lots of different democracies around the world, that um, I don't think people will allow to happen here. I don't know why I have that confidence, but I think that, I think that we've already begun to see a sense that even the winners recognize they need to do more to incorporate uh, the views of those who, um, in some sense, maybe even represented a larger proportion of the public. You know, when you have seven real parties, um, um, to be a winner is to still represent just 30% of the public. Um, and so you need to have ways of building um, a stronger sense of um, re responsiveness. So I do, th I do hope that there's a way to move on some of these issues that united, especially the opposition, like the question of enacting a new constitution based on the council's draft. Um, but, you know, again, we're just 48 hours from the election, so it's hard to know what their commitments will be. The, the Independence Party were quite opposed to it, though, weren't they? They were. Um, but, you know, a lot of that opposition got framed in a context where the battle was between those who thought the constitution should be enacted without a single word changed 
and those who believe there should only be an amendment to the existing constitution. Mm-hmm. And I see the, I think, I've noticed that in some sense, both sides have moved closer to each other. Even the Constitution Society, uh, which is the one that was really running a campaign to make this issue central to the election, um, believes that oh, the only commitment to the referendum was to enact a new constitution based on the draft of the council. Um, mm-hmm. and, and so what that means is take that as the starting point and then polish and perfect it. But you know, it's not that every word has to be enacted. It's that that's just the starting point. And if that's true, I, I can't see why um, the other side can't accept that as the starting point, and then let's argue about what modifications need to be made. But uh, um, you know, we don't. It's not actually the case that people think that the existing constitution is perfect and shouldn't be changed. Everybody acknowledges there are gaps and things to be fixed. It's just what's the starting point? Well, I would think they could gain an enormous amount of goodwill and um, support if they would give on the starting point and then, you know, push to get to the constitution everybody could ratify. Yeah, yeah. So finally, uh, on the United States, uh, what wouldn't you give to to have a different political system there than what we've got? And what do you think is going to happen in the next, in the next month or so? Well, I'm pretty sure Hillary Clinton will be elected president, and I'm pretty sure the Republicans will do everything they can to sabotage her capacity to govern. So I'm pretty sure we're going to have stalemate government for another four years at least. And I'm pretty sure the frustration and anger of Americans with the failed institution called their federal government will just grow. And that will make America even more um, uh, wedded to the idea of a Trump-like figure where Trump is recognized as an outsider who wants to shake up the system than uh, there is right now. Um, and, and so, you know, f- I don't think we're going to see Armageddon uh, because I don't think Trump will be elected. But we're um, a long way to, um, to, to curing the malady which has caused America so much stress. Mm. I produced a talk with John Pilger in, called World War Three Has Already Begun, Break the Silence. It was kind of an event as well. And he seemed to think that Hillary was more of a hawk than Trump, that she was actually more dangerous. Well, I'm sure that Hillary is more of a hawk in the sense that her military policies are, are more aggressively um, interventionist. And, and I am 1,000% opposed to the whole structure of military imperialism that the United States has practiced over the last 50 years. So I, I'm not with her at all on this. But I still think it's a safer world with Hillary Clinton as president than Donald Trump because Donald Trump could deploy his military might um, over an insult. You know, the guy has no discipline at all. And he has the thinnest skin of any leader imaginable. I mean, the man can't help himself. He gets into these positions where his advisors are all telling him, look, You've got to drop this issue. Stop attacking the parents of a war hero. Just stop. And he knows at some level he needs to stop, but he's a five-year-old. He can't control himself. So I would be terrified, and I think most of the military would be terrified, that this man is the man who is the one person in the world who really has the power to push a button and annihilate 30 million people. Um, And so... uh, um, And his own people in return. Absolutely. Um, So I... I have no doubt, and I think people are just talking crazy talk if they suggest that Hillary Clinton is more dangerous to the world than Donald Trump. Hillary Clinton, you know, I've been a critic of her in a million ways. I, um, uh, she, you know, she's not the person who I would um, select for president, um, but I think she would be a great president if she were given a chance to be president. Um, she would push policies I don't necessarily agree with, but she'd push a bunch that I do agree with. She has extraordinary experience and capacity. She's brilliant. Um, she's a real wonk, better than Bill, really more serious than he. I mean, he was a wonk for the purpose of po- uh, you know, being popular, but she's a wonk for the purpose of getting it right. And for Christ's sake, she's a woman. You know, it's ridiculous that the United States still has not elected um, 
you know, a woman to president or vice president. And, and, you know, I have a daughter. I want my daughter to look up to the president of the United States and say, that could be me. Just like I saw in 2008, African-American kids looking up to that man and say, that could be me. This is an incredibly important moment. And, you know, I think this, this quibbling about, you know, does she have exact, is just ridiculous, especially when you're gambling with such a crazy man on the other side. It's a completely, in my view, irresponsible. What do you think about what Julian Assange is releasing? I, I cannot believe, I think it's outrageous what's going on mm-hmm. with WikiLeaks right now. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think I, I'm a big believer in Snowden and the work Snowden did. And I'm a, I agree with Snowden in his criticism of WikiLeaks when he says the refusal to redact is ultimately going to bring the whole enterprise down. And, and it seems to me Julian Assange is just in a, you know, pox on both houses mode. It's like blow the system up. Mm. Well, you know, from the safety of an embassy, um, however cramped and uncomfortable it might be, that's one thing to say. But when you're talking about millions of people potentially being engaged in a war because of the consequence of one person being elected over another, mm-hmm. putting aside the nuclear question, um, that's just too precious uh, to, for respect. I mean, it's, it's the real world. And this election is a catastrophic event in the history of American democracy. Um, and uh, we don't have you know, lots of reasons to criticize the Hillary Clinton option, but I think there's no sensible position mm. that thinks she's worse mm. than electing uh, than electing Donald Trump. You, know, well, you know William Binney, he was, yeah. yeah. He said that all those leaks are coming from inside the intelligence agencies, I'm the sure. American intelligence agencies. They're very cranky because the lack of security with the email exposed about 2,000 undercover agents to danger, which is sort of confirmed by what Julian said. You'd be surprised if you knew who actually gave them. It wasn't the Russians. Obviously, I don't have any access to know one way or the other. But to know you're being, you're the cat's paw is enough without knowing who you're the cat's paw for. Right? Like, you should step back once you realize you're being used by somebody. Um, and the defense, while well, I'm just giving the information, is a pretty naive defense if, you know, you don't begin to recognize that, if, you know, you're being played, you're being played for a reason. I think Julian's always a lot more active than that. I think he's very worried if, if Hillary is elected, she will be his nemesis. Well, the idea that this turns this this election should turn on what's good for Julian Assange is a little crazy, right? Because there's a lot more at stake than Julian Assange, and you know, God bless him for what he did uh, in setting up a culture of of building um, uh, leaks into the much more into the fabric of how we test and limit governments. But um, if the choice is Julian Assange or Donald Trump, I take. Sacrificing Julian Assange with Donald Trump, I sacrifice Julian Assange to make sure we don't have Donald Trump. Were you angry when WikiLeaks mentioned that Aaron had been involved with WikiLeaks just after he died? Yeah, it's not true. Yeah. I had spoken to Aaron about it. I know it's not true. Yeah. And it seemed to me completely cowardly to try to... Opportunity. Yeah, I mean, it was just terrible. And... So I think that was the first moment I began to sour on the whole enterprise because it was like, wow, you know, if you're going to do this, then there's no limit. Brigitte and I both got our fingers burned. Yeah. yeah. No, I know she's really angry. Yeah. Well, I'm not the kind to get angry or even, but I just take my distance. And yeah. I've been working um, on refugee issues and uh, I'm very much back into the liquid democracy possibly, but, you know, different kind of future, all the things that you're talking about. I I think Donald Trump is the proof that American democracy is in crisis. No, of course it's in crisis, yeah. There must be so many people just saying, how did this happen? Yeah. Yeah, we're all there. Thank you very much. Sure, thank you. That was great. Yep, thank you.